as we begin our midweek service on that will first air on September the 2nd. I want us to look at faith works. This Sunday we're going to be sharing about to the work. You may remember that hymn that will be our emphasis, but I want us to look at the book of James. Early in the church, there was some question about the relationship between faith and action. Did you have to earn your salvation? And could you be saved, but be what we might call not very involved or inactive? And so James is that book written to try to remind us that we who are believers are bought with a price, but for a reason. And so we want to look at that. I want to begin to read in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed or lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace and be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Interesting. And James is just laying it out very clearly. So I just want us to look for a few moments at some of these verses and the truth that they share with us. In verse 14, he says, But what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Early in the church faith, there had been a desire to have levels. We still want that, don't we? We, want, we, we use that same terminology even today, active members versus inactive members. Maturing Christians versus immature Christians growing Christians versus stagnated Christians or members. Well, what do you really think? That a non-resident, inactive, immature, stagnated person, where do you really think they're going to spend eternity? Well, that's not for us, and I know that. But I wouldn't want that to be my resume when I stood before God, who sent his son to die on the cross, to bring me salvation. How about you? He then asked that next question in, in verse 14. Can that faith save him? That kind of, of immature faith, that kind of faith that is what we might say in, in name only or, or only a head knowledge kind of faith, one that doesn't really infiltrate a person's life. Can that kind of faith save him? And James is assuming the answer is no. That, that kind of faith has no saving power. He's using what we call a diatribe, a, a style of teaching where the teacher puts up questions that people might ask as though they're standing there with him, and then he answers their questions. We'll see that again in just a few moments. But his answer is, no, that kind of faith is no good. 
Jesus, remember, talked about salt that's lost its its savor, its power is good for nothing. But to be trodden underfoot, same kind of thing. He goes on in verse 15, If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and someone says to them, Go in peace and be warmed and filled without giving them the things, what good is that? And again, James anticipates the answer to be, that's good for nothing. That's, that's no good. That, that's not what we need to be doing. That's not the role of the church. In verse 17, so also faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, he just says it plainly. It's dead. And I want us to understand a dead faith is no faith at all. Faith is seen as the living expression of the spirit within a body. He'll get back to that in verse 26 of our text where he talks about the body apart from the spirit is dead. He, he's saying that faith without the works is like a dead body. Without the breath, without the, the ruah is the, the Hebrew word, the spirit, the, that part that God breathed in us. And he's saying that, it, it, that faith without works is like a corpse. It's no good. Then he goes back to his diatribe in verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Then James responds to that. Show me your faith apart from your works. And he's including you can't do that. It's impossible. And I'll show you my faith by my works. There's two important theological truths here. First is that faith comes not works, that faith comes first. You don't earn your salvation. You don't, you don't do works that make you good enough to have faith. You believe first. You trust in God first. It is, it is a movement of the heart before action follows. So the first feel like the truth is that faith is first. The second important theological truth is that faith is always followed by works. That genuine faith will always have an outward expression. The inward change will always have an outward expression. And we call that works. That can be faithfulness to church. That can be reading your Bible. That can be studying uh, in, in, a, in a larger group and encouraging other believers to grow in their faith. That That's mission opportunities. That's going to feed people and 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 to, to clothe people and to help people during the hurricane season. We know our Baptist men respond with, with good works, but they're faith-driven good works. He goes on in verse 19. He says, you believe that God is one, you do well. So it's as though they are saying, well, we have some theology. We don't do anything about it, but we know some stuff. He says, even the demons do that and they shudder. His point is that belief as they were defining faith, that I have faith in God. I believe in God. How many times in America do we, everybody, you know, will sing God bless America, but not want to make any desire to do the work of God. That's what he's talking about. To just say, God bless America or God bless me or I believe in God and I love God. But I, God has no impact in my life. God has no, uh, no tangible way of being expressed in what I say or do. I kind of run my own show. I do what I want to do. I don't really pay attention to what God wants me to do. I just do what I want to do. He say, no, no, that's, that's not going to get it. That's what the, the devils believe there's a God. They just don't honor him. They just don't love him. They just don't enter into relationship with him. And how do you know you, when you're in a relationship with him? I'm glad you asked. Your works. Your works are how that's proven. A head knowledge without a life change is not salvation, James is saying. The evidence of a life change is because the belief that we have is followed by fruit, is what Jesus often called it. By their fruit, you shall know them. A tree that doesn't bear good fruit is good for nothing to be cut down. James just says, if you don't have works, I can't show you faith without works, but I can show you faith through works. Then in verse 20, he says, 
Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? And he uses that word useless. It's good for nothing. It's absolutely fruitless. It has no power. It has no saving power. It has no eternal power. It has no life-changing power. If you simply say, my faith is, yeah, I believe there's a God. Yeah, there's some kind of God somewhere, somehow. And I'll pay that kind of attention to that kind of God. But that's all I'm going to do. I'm not really going to be influenced by that kind of God. I'm not really going to allow that God to have an inroad in my life, to change me and make a big difference in my life. And he calls that person a foolish person. Do you hear what he says that? The calling one foolish is again that diatribe model that he began in verse 18 where he's simply saying the one who says that there is no God. You remember he says, but someone will say, and he's saying, if you're saying that, that I have faith and you have works and I don't have to have works to have faith, he's saying, you're a foolish person. That That's simply not true. Useless faith has no transforming power. If our life is not being transformed, you remember what Paul said, be therefore transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the power of faith and works together to make a difference. He goes on in verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was acted along with his works and faith was completed by his works we know that story when abraham had in his old age finally had his son isaac and one day god said take the boy up to a place i'm going to show you and offer him as a sacrifice wow what a what a call for action what a task what an assignment from god and would one who had faith in God follow it with that kind of action if you really believe that's what God was calling you to do? And we know Abraham did that. We know Abraham went up, and you know the story in Genesis where just as he was about to slay his son Isaac on that altar, God stayed his hand and provided a ram. And he said, I know, Abraham, you won't even withhold your only son from me. And that was accounted unto Abraham as righteousness. I want us to understand that Abraham in this moment is a prototype of what God is going to do when he sends his son, Jesus Christ, and he is sacrificed on the altar we call the cross. And on that altar we call the cross, your sin and my sin were paid for. God did that kind of salvific work, that kind of work for salvation for you and for me. You and I must respond in like kind with the same kind of work that would show others that we have given ourselves over to this God that we genuinely love. He goes on to use the idea that uh, justification uh, comes by works and not by faith alone. And he uses the story of Rahab. You remember she hi she hides the uh, the spies and uh, and they are they are saved by her hiding them and and ultimately uh, she is saved because of her faith and because of her action. Then he gives us verse twenty six. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead. So also faith apart from works is dead. And again, the idea being a human body without a soul, we call that a corpse. We call that a dead body. We say that is no longer in earthly terms useful. He's saying that faith, if you say I am a believer, I am a follower of Christ, but I have no works. I don't show that. I don't live that every day. That's not in my everyday actions. I have, I don't have the works of faith that line up with the head knowledge of faith or the Bible knowledge of faith. I, I simply do certain things, but I'm not really sold out fully and completely to God. He would say that is not faith at all. James concludes with faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. 
Can you work and earn your salvation? No, it's a gift from God. But once you receive the gift, once God has blessed you with salvation, once you have said, I recognize that you provided a way through Jesus Christ. And if I would make him the Lord, the boss of my life and do what he wants me to do from here forward, I would have everlasting life. Then the work begins. You don't do it to get to that place. But once you get to that place, then you'll follow that by doing the work. This Sunday, we'll be talking about to the work. We'll use a story that Jesus gives us about people in two kingdoms and separating goats and sheep. You may already know Matthew 25, but we'll share that this Sunday. Now, as we close, may we do so with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as our chimes pay, play in the background, we are grateful that you are always with us and guiding us. And your spirit, like a still small voice, continually calls us. You'd remind us even at this time of maybe tomorrow, someone we need to talk to, someone we might need to pray for, someone we might need to make a cake or, or make a phone call or stop by and say hello. You would remind us of that person who doesn't know you in the pardon and forgiveness of their sins. And you'd lay them on our heart to pray for them and to seek a way that we might share the good news of the gospel with them in a life-changing way. And, and at some point, through boldness, invite them to accept you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, you know the need of every heart here to be about the work that you've called us to be about. Would you help us, O oh God, that we who are people of faith would not be inactive, we'd be active. We would not be non-resident, we would be very present, we would be resident. That we would not be immature, we would be maturing. We would not be stagnant, we'd be growing in our work in order that our faith might continue to develop, that we might be able to present to you on that day and hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Our prayers in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, church family, I wanted to share a few announcements with you all. First, um, Neil Medlin is now at Sanford Health and Rehab, and so we want to continue praying for him um, as he continues to uh, progress and get better, but we just want to remember him in our prayers. Also, an update from the deacons meeting last night. Um, we are excited to be able to offer you an in-person worship opportunity on Sunday, September the 13th at 8.30 in the morning. We will be meeting outside, and so we're meeting at 8.30 so that hopefully it'll be a little cooler for us. Um, but you are invited to come and bring a chair. Socially distance yourselves in those chairs and spread out a little bit so that everyone can feel comfortable worshiping with us. And so we're going to have a worship service outside. Um, the speakers are going to broadcast our sound, so if you feel more comfortable staying in your car, you are welcome to do that as well. You may not be able to see, but you will be able to hear. Um, so just know that we are going to be offering that opportunity on Sunday, September the 13th at 8.30 in the morning. Also, wanted to um, ask something a little bit special from our church family. Uh, the Kemp family is moving to Tennessee. Um, they, they are from Tennessee, and so they are moving back home and... Um, getting closer to family, that sort of thing, but we certainly are going to miss them. And so as a way to um, let them know that we love them and that we are just sending them off with, with prayers and well wishes for a, a wonderful move and experience in Tennessee, um, we would like to have a parade for them. And so we are inviting the church family on Tuesday, September the 8th, to meet us here at church in the church parking lot at 6.30. You can come with your car decorated. You can come with a sign. You can come with a card. Or you can just come with yourself. 
and we will head to the Kemp's house. They live in Doe Run, and we're going to just drive by their house and honk our horns and, and let them know how much they mean to us and how much we're going to miss them. Um, so again, Tuesday, September the 8th at 6.30, we'll meet here in the parking lot, and then we'll head to the Kemp's house um, so that we can wish them well on their move to Tennessee. Thank you and hope that y'all are doing well. We are so excited to be able to see y'all on the 13th and we look forward to that.